So tonight we're going to talk about NUX design patterns. Okay, guys, uh, let me introduce Michael Morland. Uh, he's a friend of mine, and I have been working with him like decades. And he started his professional experience from Commodore 64. I'm not sure who remembers this kind of beast. Okay, one, two, two. three. Okay, so remember, there's a memory of that huge computer was 64 kilobytes and no more. And you have to really, really work hard to make the program run and be efficient. Okay, so somehow Michael was able to manage it and he got to right now and working with Angular, which is kind of, hopefully it's much more efficient than it was. Then. So by the way, you probably know him as a creator of Angular Beast code snippets for Visual Code, Visual Studio Code. So it was downloaded almost a million over the last year so I think it was most popular snippets uh, for Angular. <coughs> so Oleg Maniak. Uh, I've been working with Oleg for over 14 years. His experience straddles two centuries. <laughs> <laughs> he is Russian, in case you haven't noticed, and yeah. he is awesome with a knife. He's actually <laughs> he's a great painter. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, some design patterns, past, present, and future. So we'll go with the history, start with MVC, MVVM. Then we're going to move over to the story architectural patterns, Flux, Redux, NURX. And then we're going to dive deeper in, into NURX, look at some patterns and techniques. So <clears throat> this is actually all the things we're going to talk about tonight. It's a long journey, so just stay with us, we promise. We're going to explain it all. So Oleg, how did it all get started? Actually, it was started a while, while back from punch cards. If you remember that, it was a very, very complicated approach to feed the data to the computer systems. So right now is web development. It is a very, very interesting topic. And, and we all know the web development is really, really uh, like rocketing exponentially. And the most complex things in the web development is state management, right? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, patterns, about the single page application, what it does and what approaches are. So single page application, it's amazing. In previous century, when I was working like a web developer, there was like Netscape 4.7, there was like Internet Explorer, and you don't think about the sing single page application at all. Right now, what you would like to have, web application responsive. User would like to interact with data. You would like to refresh your data immediately. We don't want to refresh the whole page, right? A application behave like naturally based on the information and based on the user interactions. So, but all this technology bring a lot of backend work to the client side. And a lot of patterns that we used to have on the client, on the server side comes to, to web development, such as MVC, MVP, uh, model view, view models. All those things is for certain purpose. It makes developer life easier, or at least a management of application better. So let's just take a look uh, on some of the issues that we might have. I'm not sure, I think most of you, like maybe like four or five years ago, you hear about this a bug, famous Facebook chat counter bug. Who remembers that? Like, okay, quite a bit of you. So what's the problem? It's like small bug, who cares? It is, was a number of unread messages was incorrect. You can see that number of unread messages five, but you can go to details, actually there is none. It is kind of quite a bit of annoying. So Facebook, what they used to at that point of time, they use MVC model. So when you start small application, MVC model works pretty well. You have your model, you have your presentation layer view, talking together, it's great. But once you start expanding, and there's more models and more views, and they start talking to each other, it's become a mess. And actually, the support of this model is not so easy, and especially to know who and when and how this information was updated. Keep this information in sync is really, really hard. So Facebook was spending a month they tried to fix bug. It's come over in a different place with different flavor. So spend months and months and months until they come up with another approach. Uh, sorry, step back. 
So let's just talk first of all, what was the problem? First of all, they understand the first is multiple view models on the same business data is not great. Data mutation, so shared data ownership or data encapsulation, it is a problem because you have multiple places update the same data points. It's not great. And application and state is not predictable. It's completely unpredictable who and what and how it was updated. So Michael, how does this solve this problem? That's a good question. Anyway, they invented something called Flux. So the big difference here is that you have a unified data flow. So you can see now you have data moving in a circle instead. And a big sign that you've had this problem in your own programs is if you ever have a developer that's changing a part of the code and then something completely else breaks, that's because you have all these dependencies that you see that are cross and you don't really know what's affected and why it's affected. But Facebook moved over to have this unified data flow and what they call a predictable state container. So in this case, you have a dispatcher that becomes the central hub for the data flow. So you have an action and it, the dispatch will handle that action, uh, pass it into the store, the store well then, the view will look at the store, and the view is the only thing that can create a new uh, action. And in this case, you can only have one action at a time, and that's what makes this a predictable state. <coughs> so after this, everything was sunshine. So does the story end here, Oleg? No, it was just only beginner. So then Abramov come up even with better approach. He came up with idea, actually it was amazing, the library was like 18 lines of a code. And it is like right now the most useful and most helpful, most popular library uh, uh, in software development for web development. So what he defined is uh, actually three base and simple principles. Number one, a single source of the truth, it's your store. The state of whole your application stored in the object tree in one location. Principle number two, the state is read only. We never update the same object. We just create another one and we modify previous one and create another snapshot. But it's most important how and what's going on. So again, would like to say is it is immutable JavaScript uh, object on the application level. It is global object that all all components can access. What is this? So, oh, Oleg, why do we care about immutable states? Right, this is a big difference. Uh, first of all, immutability concept. It is you can have a history. You never modified your existing state. You create new one. Uh, all changes are synchronous. This means that there's only one strict order to update your data. We always know who, when, and how the data was updated. Um, because of that, there's less problem with race conditions. It is very tasteable, it is isolated, and it's once you're done with your test, you'll probably never modify it. It is already kind of very efficient and uh, uh, easy for debugging. But what is required, it's required development discipline. You have to follow the pattern, you have to follow the rules. So the third principle is the changes of your state done via poor functions, which call reducers. So the idea of the poor function, it is take a previous state, an action that define what should be changed, and produce next state. This guarantee the value always predictable, the state of application always predictable. So poor functions, it's come from, it came from fun, fun, functional programming. programming. The output of function depends only on the input parameters. There are no other impacts on the logic of your function and re results. Poor functions, they have no idea about your state. Poor functions, they don't have any side effects. It's much easier to test and the result is predictable. So we can see this uh, small function that we, I wrote. It is actually is looping through the array, and it is calculating the running value. You can see there is two parameters, 
uh, for this function its value and state, and the result is always consistent. We can provide different value that can be impact the result, but regardless, if you provide same values, the result always the same. This is the beauty of the functional development. So, how does it relate to Angular? That's a good, qu that's a good question. question. <laughs> <laughs> so, how is it related to Angular? All this crap is, when I look at the two years ago, I have no idea about Angular at all. So, when I read this Angular IO, I figured out, hey, there's no problem at all. Angular provides uh, unified directions, and I should not worry about this, right? So, let's take an example. I have this smart component that have a data through the service. The dumb com smart component communicates with child components through the input, which is kind of uh, data flow, data in, and output is event out. Nice. I have this one component done. Next one, I created more child. They communicate the same way. No problem at all. So once I start expanding more and more and more, it looks like the same problems that we have with Facebook. Once the become, application become more complex, when you would like to have more interactions on the same data, we run the Facebook famous bug. So, Michael, is there what we can do now? Let's find out. So, Rob Warmold uh, took a look at Redux, and Redux was using uh, callbacks at the time but he decided to use observables instead. So he combined Redux with observables and Angular, and he called it Redux. It's the best breed of three of those. So today, NGRX is a collection of reactive libraries for Angular. So it started with Flux, then came Redux, which, by the way, was actually only 99 lines of code. Slightly bigger fish here, but it's still small. And and your X came along, and with observables, you can actually do this in two lines of code now. <clears throat> so, and your X. How did components change with and your X? So, components are the only are only responsible for rendering the UI. They are no longer responsible for state management. This makes them very easy to test. State management. Who's responsible for state management? The only place you can change the state is in the reducer. A reducer does this by first copying this state and then it updates it. This means that a reducer is now a pure function, and as Oleg described, pure function, they are also very easy to test. So where's the state? The state's been abstracted out of a component, so you have it in the central store now. So it's on the global level. So you're all thinking now, OK, global, coming from a background, object RNA, global is bad. So yes, global mutable state is bad. But global immutable state is actually pretty great, because nobody can change it. So here's our triple rainbow. Triple M rainbow. Let's take a look at what our example app looks like. Sure. Bring it up, Michael. Okay, so here's a simple Angular application, and it is just to do application. So what we can do is actually create first to do. And we can edit, we can have one more. And we can modify it, we can delete, and we can, we can say, hey, it's done, the to-do complete. We'll use a simple application to show you what's going on under the hood. Fair OBS. That's not it. Oh, 
Oh, fair. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure we get the thing. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> so we just showed you the to do apps application, and it's out on Firebase, so you can try it yourself. We'll also show some other cool tools later, and we'll have a code published on GitHub so you can get to it and play with it. So let's walk through an example in NDRX, and then later what the code actually looks like. So if you remember, you have a component that dispatch an action. So in our case, we have uh, inside, sorry, inside the store, <coughs> you have something called effects, and you have a reducer that we talked about. So the action will be picked up by either one of those. In our example, it's going to be the reducer. And it, again, the reducer takes the current state, copies it, creates a new state, and then the component will basically subscribe to that state via a select statement. So a little bit more interesting, now with code. So we have our add to do function here, uh, but get the add to do action. Uh, you can see the store object, a dispatch uh, member, and inside of that we pass in the to do. And our action has uh, both a type and a payload. So the type is to do add, and the payload is the title that we get from the add to do function, the parameter. And then, in our case, we want to set done to false by default when we create the to-do. Ah. This one? Yep. Yep. Thanks, because now we actually have notes, too. <laughs> <laughs> so... <coughs> Let's take a look. Hey, we have another organizer showing up on time. <laughs> and more guests. Pizza in the back. So we created the to-do action. So here's the to-do reducer. So the to-do reducer will start out with a state. The initial state in our case is just a blank object. And then it will take a to-do. So a reducer is actually just a simple switch statement that will look at the action type. So in our case, we have a to-do add, and you can see inside that we're going to return the new state, and the way we do that is we copy the existing state, and here you can see the spread operator that's used to copy it. We're taking the to-do that we passed in, which is actually in the action payload, and then create the new state out of those. Another thing that's easy, very important to know is when you create these reducers, if you don't have a case that's matched, you should always have the default case at the bottom that's actually returning the state just again, as it was before. So <coughs> when you have a reducer, create a new state, going over to the component, the component uh, has a a stream of to-dos that it's basically getting from selecting the from it um, using the store to select the to-do reducer. I'll show you what the store looks like. So it's very easy to set up the store module, just include it from NUX store. You have your own to-do sir function that you created. So we're going to use store module for root and then pass in the to-do reducer. So the reason I'm using for root peer for root is because this is the app module. If this was a feature module, you would use for feature instead. Other than that, it looks identical. So really, one line of code to set up the store. Actions. I mentioned the action has a type and a payload. The type is actually just a string. In our case, it's a constant. And then you can again see the payload, it's a title, and a boolean for if it's done or not. Okay, this is a nice story, it's easy. How about scenario when you have to get data from your server? I know you were caring about the getting data from the server. He's a former DB manager here. Yeah. <laughs> so, getting data from a server. Now we're talking about something called side effects. And side effects 
is when you have an action and it's actually asynchronous. So in this case, you know when you're going to get a return back. So it's going to call whatever could be facts. You don't know when the answer is coming back. Uh, but when it does, it's going to create a new action and have that result as a payload. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what this scenario looks like in code. So again, we have an action. In our case, we're now dispatching uh, get to do's. And this slide cut off this. Yep, it's. Um, <clears throat> So, again, we dispatch the action. This time it gets picked up by uh, the effects. And I mentioned it's a side effect. So if we take a look at what this does, you have a side effect that's actually going to go out and call something else, the cloud database server, whatever. And it's going to return something at some point. It could be a success, it could be a failure. And in our case, we have two different messages based on if it's later on a success or a failure. And you can see the payload in the end is then either the new uh, to-dos or the payload is the error message that we're going to pass back. And again, this new action gets picked up by the reducer. That's where you can copy the existing state and create a new state. <coughs> so this is the code for that. So you can see the uh, get to do stream that we have. Uh, effects look slightly different from the reducers. So you can see the action stream. So we're actually looking at the action stream. And then we're trying to filter out the, the get to do's. So we do that with something called off type. Once we've found the action we're interested in, we're going to pass it on to the get to do API and then get the result back, create a new action, and set the new type if it's success or failure, and then add on the payload for the to-dos if it's an error or not. So again, at this point we get to the reducer, it receives the new action we just created with the get to-dos, and at this in this case, we example in getting the to-dos from the payload. So what other type of effects are there, Oleg? Sure. So let's just a little bit review what we have learned. So Michael described a side effects. It is one of the type effects. So in reality, as we mentioned it, uh, in GREX, it is programming with messages. And this is important things to understand. Reducer, this is where you keep your logic how to update a state. But effects, this is, is how the whole this orchestration going on. How you can convert one action to another one, or sequence actions, or to do something crazy based on the basic building blocks. So I'm a fan of Viktor Savkin, and he's the smartest guy, definitely smarter than me. So he wrote a very interesting article, and he used pictograms how to describe um, effects and what they do. So there's two more types of the effects. Transformers, they transform actions to other actions, and deciders. So in reality, they decided what to do with actions and proceed or not. Transformers, sorry, it's the wrong one. So Transformers. The first one is we can call enricher. All this it is logical grouping of events with messages. So here we can see in reality, content enricher adds some information to the actions payload. So I highlighted in yellow what's going on. In reality, we just take payload. I'm sorry for the action add to do by user. We just take payload and add a current user. Very simple. So the next one is normalizer. Normalizer maps a few similar actions to the same action. For example, we have a generic action which is called insert to do. 
there is two of them. Um, one of them insert to do, and another one you can see below append to do. But both of them call same action which called add to do. They just only provide a different information into the payloads. So the two actions map to same by the end, just add one more in richer by the end, right? So deciders, this is the hardest topic for me. I kind of spend a couple nights trying to understand logically what is that. So there's a five types, splitter, aggregator, filters, content-based deciders, context-based deciders. We are going to take a look quickly on each of them. A filter, as Michael described, it's very simple. We just have to filter out what kind of actions and what you would like to do with actions. It is of type and you provide a string of your action. Content-based decider. This is a very interesting one. It is decided what to do based on the action payload information. Payload is something that's very helpful information and you can decide what to do with that. Here, for example, we grab add to do and we check what was last and we just redirect. Do you want to append, call append to do actions or you would like to insert to do actions? So we just redirect one way or another or whatever the cases are. Context-based decider is completely opposite. It's use information of injected object on the actions and decided what to do with this action, redirected. A splitter. Splitter maps an action to multiple actions. So here, for example, we can have one action which called request add to do, which create two new asynchronous actions, add to do and log operator. Remember, effects, they are asynchronous. But by the end, when they call a reducer, this is where synchronous, synchronous uh, <laughs> flow become played. This is where update our states, right? Aggregator, it's, it tells themselves. You have two, you have multiple actions and you can, can weight all of them and combine all of them into one action. So, how does it help us, Michael? <clears throat> how do these patterns help us? So, <clears throat> we now have a common language to talk about the complex code in our class. And you have to remember, when you're looking at NURX, everything actually became very simple and very... <clears throat> so we abstracted, in our case, out all the complexity into the effects. So that's why we need a way of talking about what we're actually going to do. So, <clears throat> let's see who actually paid attention. <laughs> so, what is this first pattern here? What? Anyone else? No. Anyone else? It it's a filter. Oh. The second one, anyone want to guess? Yes. Did you check out my slide yesterday? Mm -hmm. Okay, third one. Content decider. That, after that, we have some side effects. And the last one in our case, splitter, yes. Good. <clears throat> so let's walk through a scenario. Uh, let's pretend we have two side effects already. One's called append to do and one called insert to do. So somebody's a manager and it's going to tell the developers, hey, hey, let's create a new effect called add to do. It would be very impressive if manager actually told us that, but let's pretend. <coughs> so we want, in this new effect, we want to use the parameter to decide which one of these side effects we want to use. Uh, the second part is that we want to actually add some user info to this payload. Uh, third, we want to use the property to determine which of these two side effects we're going to call. And fourth, we actually want to log this as well. So yes, now it gets complicated. And I don't want to lose you again, so let's take a step back. So if we 
break up this code in different blocks. So I said, we have two side effects. That's what you see at the bottom. If we now look at the first line of code up here, <coughs> that's our filter. We will look for the add to do. Then we have this, the second line, and that is our enricher. Uh, I'll step back. So that's where we actually enrich uh, our payload and also append the current user. And then our third part here is our content-based decider. So that's where we're looking at the to-do and then the append property and basically an if statement, which side effect we're going to call, and then we the payload will then be uh, the append property. And last here, we have a splitter. So you can see here, this is actually, we take this to do action, we'll split it up in two new actions, and one of them will just be the plain action, and one of them will go to our log function, which will be another effect or another reducer. So T is our to-do. Right. So yes, in our simple example, we didn't have an append property. But it was one of the things we, we wanted to add in this example here. Okay. We added one more property to our to-do. To is that in the payload or to the to-do? So the, the to-do is the payload. Gotcha. Okay. So you have a to-do. It's going to have a title, and it's going to have a done, the boolean. And in our case, we added one more property to that. That's the append. Thank you. Good question. So what we gain with this is now all the complexity is in one central place, the effects. <coughs> so the best way by handling all of that is basically have common patterns, common building blocks, and a common way to talk about what's complex in your code. And of course, have other developers review it and speak to them. So, the NGX debugger. You can set up the debugger with just one line of code. And I've set that up in the to-do example. Uh, <coughs> so, in our case, you just need to include it from the NGRX, uh, the store dev tools. And then you have one line that basically can enable the debugger when we are not on the production environment. So, debugging and time traveling. This is where it gets interesting. It's very easy. Actually, anyone can do it. Yesterday, he had a slide. Even manager can do this. Okay. So, <laughs> let's try. Let's see. Uh-oh. I need the help. Where is that? <laughs> let's take a look at the Redux dev tools. First, you have to download them from the Chrome store. But when you've, once you've done that, you'll see that this icon for the tool itself will be enabled if you're on a page that has Redux on it. So you're going to open it up, dock it to the left side and make it a little bit bigger. In our case, we have an empty store at the moment. You can see the state is empty. So let's create some to-dos. The action showing up to the left for all the actions that you perform. I'm going to mark the first to-do done. And I'm going to delete the third to-do. Okay, so I took five actions and all five actions are now showing up on the left side. What's really cool about this is that you can also step back in time to any of the previous state. And you can also hit play and it will replay the states for you. <coughs> if it's a state you don't want to use, like this toggle here, you can go ahead and actually skip it. And now the action will 
show up with its default state again. Another cool thing is that you can also create unit test straight from the dev tools. So let's take a look at our first action. And I'm going to switch over to the test tab here. <clears throat> You'll notice on top here, you can actually switch between different templates. Uh, I'm going to go over to the Mocha template. So here you can see your test case in Mocha. You can see it's declaring the state, setting the state. This is your initial state, which is actually empty. And then you have your action, which you have type to do with the payload. The last part of this unit test is the expected result. Here you can see that I'm expecting the state to equal a new to do with title first to do. It's a simple test, but the good news is you got it for free. And if you want to, you can add in more and more actions and create more and more complicated tests. So easy, anyone can do it. Yes. <laughs> so let's take a look at some pros and cons with NURX. So we now have a clear methodology. We have DevTools, and these are actually not Angular DevTools. These are the same DevTools used by Redux. When you talk about React, it's the same thing. It just plugs in and should work together. Uh, you have all the actions in one place. That means when you have a new developer coming and looking at the code, he can actually start by just opening up and take a look at the actions and figure out what the application is doing. It's easy to debug, easy to re reproduce the bug, because again, we can just open up the dev tools. We can have somebody have an error on production, and then we can go in and open up that state, or we can have something that actually logs that state and since our entire state is in the store, it means that we can open up ac the application to the point of time and see what they saw. And from then on, we can replay the action that they took and see the error that they did. So the beauty of this also, remember, Angular, this idea of lazy loaders. You can build your modules, and the module already can be easy to plug in because module can now and talk to the global state uh, and the store. So this is a really efficient way to expand uh, the application. So let's say we log the state from it, that the user had that error. That means we can now create a test out of that state. We have exact state, we have exact action, and we can see what they took and what error that produced. And we can create that as a unit integration test and then give it to QA or use it ourselves to basically first reproduce it and then check that this error will never ever happen again. Just a quick question on that, and, and because that's really valuable to me. Uh, if a production user is obviously they're going about their own business doing this thing, um, do they need to have this extension on their machine to get access? Because can I export their store to my machine to run QA's test? So the question is, how do you get access to the user store? Yes, you can have something that's actually, in case they have an error, at that point, you have the entire state. You can log the entire state, uh, write it to wherever you want to do. Uh, you can even send it in an email to yourself. The only thing it is change the way what the store looks like. So you don't want to have really nested JavaScript object because any changes create another instance, another instance. So it depends on the device, you can kill it. So you can have like maybe five instances of the last states, right? Or you have to use a database term such as normalize your data. Try to use a key and value, key and value, key and value, which is make another stuff. Your data store become very close to the database structure usually, and especially if it's not SQL database. 
So the cons are, however, we have now more libraries we're dependent on. We have some more boilerplate code to write, but honestly, we shouldn't be afraid of writing more code if it helps our life. And there's also a possibility with race conditions, but there's ways to deal with that. So Michael, how we can reduce the boilerplate code? Somehow I knew you were going to ask that question. You're supposed to have two mics. <laughs> yeah. Anybody that can hook up two USB mics to one computer and get it to work will need. Exactly. <laughs> now you know why we have that on the slide. So, Michael Norwald, they. Uh, sorry. No. Next slide. Uh, NGX Entities was just released in NGX 4.1, and that's actually something that will help you create a lot of things. So it will reduce your boilerplate, but we're going to do that as a future talk instead of today. And as I started mentioning, Norwell also created something called NX, they call it uh, their new workspaces, and that's something that works together with the, with the Angular CLI and the new schematics that's just released in 1.5. Uh, so that will help you create new applications, and it's very easy to hook up in your X with that and create new code for your components as well. So Redux is not great for making simple things. So it's not a pattern for everyone. If you're just going to write a small application, like a to-do application, it's probably not the right pattern. But it's great for making hard things simple. Think about big enterprise applications where you need a unified way of working with states. So some of the resources for this presentation that we used, of course, Facebook, they developed Flux. Then Dan Abramov came around with Redux. And Rob Wallman, the creator of NDRX, and the core team, Mike Ryan, and Brandon Roberts. You can find great presentations on IndieConf, previous conferences, just look up these names. Uh, Dan has a great tutorial on Egghead, it's completely free, it will tell you every, everything about Redux and more in only 99 lines of code. Uh, Victor, that Oleg mentioned, yes, he's a Russian and he is really good at understanding these things. Uh, he came up with these design patterns that we looked at tonight and a special friend to our Duncan. That's He's Australian, but he had a couple meetings with us and practicing our presentation with us together. <laughs> and he actually teaches NURX around the world. Yes, like six months ago. <laughs> At Google presentation, right? Yeah, there you go. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Need a quick break? Yeah, More pizza, Craig? In our case, it was non production. So, if you have a public website, yes, then you might want to be a little bit careful what you put in your state. Uh, a lot of that's still going to be in your database, right? You're not going to need to have all of it back. Uh, and yes, you don't need to log put everything in the store. You have to be think a little bit about it. But anything that actually helps you to cre recreate that state, that's what needs to be in the store. But why you would like to bring PI information? If you bring it up, any hacker can open it from and can see this, right? So this is kind of still a dangerous area. It's still opened. So if you're saying that to record each action that the user takes is a matter of forcing and doing this, does this mean that the size of your store is just going to grow continually as the user uses your application? Yes, if you have the debugger on, uh, basically that line of code where I enabled the debugger. But the thing is, it also takes a parameter, so you can say that you want to keep five copies of your, your store. So you can define that when you create a debugger. So 
But of course, if you want to log something that the user is doing, then you might want to put some logic yourself in your code. That's how many versions of a store you want to keep. Okay, so your old versions of the store will fall out of memory after a while. Yes, if you say you only want to keep five and you would only have the last five. Okay. But you could always keep a lot more actions and you could keep a really old state if you just want to replay what they did. As long as they never hit or saved anything to the database, you could actually replay that. Think about it, if you had a game, you could actually, if you were single player, you could actually replay the entire game by just having the initial store and then all the actions. You wouldn't need all the, the stores in between. So in reality, you should not include this in production, right? It is a U, like for on dev and test, you can have run all those test cases and you can see exactly what's going on, right? On the production, it's probably not great to have the debugger, but still give you a way to see what's happened with your application. Again, you have to avoid really deep nested object structure because it's really, really expanded. It's taken memory. So you have to change the way how you model the data. Well, today, most things are already easy for the hacker if you have it in the browser. Like, you have to treat everything in the browser as unsecure. You can never store password, whatever. All that security is still always going to need be on your API. Or you have to encrypt it, or you have to hash it somehow, right? If you hash it, you still could have the hash maybe if you use. can do it now, right? Or you can stop, you can run debugger, you can choose the console, you can do whatever you want. Right? So you have to really take care about your API or your REST call. You have to, this is what you have to protect. So maybe you need some functions to <coughs> keep the, the access in addition to Oh, sure. I mean, access is a completely separate topic, right? It is... Uh, but you have to remember what you're seeing is your own access. Like, you're not seeing somebody else's store when you're on your computer. You're only seeing your state. So if you want to hack your own user account and figure out your own password, then yes, this is a backdoor to spy on your wife, maybe. <laughs> if you share a computer, yeah. <laughs> okay, which kind of account she was using? <laughs> Great idea. Then you, of course, need your wife to go to a place that actually uses Redux first, but... <laughs> Yeah, we should have practiced that.